What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash and today is December 13th of 2019. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's update we're going to be talking about a wide range of things from analyzing some key altcoins that we're watching to also talking about some key data points in relation to central bank monetary policy that could give us a good view of what's going on in traditional markets. We've got all that and more coming up right after our quick sponsor. Our sponsor for this episode is Exodus. Without a doubt, Exodus is one of my favorite wallets on the market. The user experience is pristine, cutting down on unnecessary clutter that's common in most traditional wallets. It's not only provided a smooth design, but also comes with added functionality like making exchanges from within the wallet, meaning you won't need to leave the wallet to make a trade on some of our top plays like Chainlink and Basic Attention Token. And the greatest thing of all is you can access your funds across multiple devices, from mobile to desktop. For more information, check out the link down below and get started with Exodus today. Alrighty everyone, so let's go ahead and start off by taking a look across the board for cryptocurrency markets. As we can see over the last 24 hours, most cryptocurrencies are in a no-trend scenario across the board. Here we do have some plays leading the market here at the top plays, for example, like Kyber Network. We've been seeing a lot of DeFi getting coverage across the market right now and really starting to tick upwards. Now, as you can see, our market cap has not changed too much, so I don't want to look too much at analytics right now in the kind of broader sense of markets, but I do want to focus in on a few key cryptocurrencies. Now, there are a few ones that we're watching I'm gonna talk about today, uh, really four that I'm looking at for potential, uh, you know, not only potential trades, but like also just general positions over the next few weeks, months, uh, the time frames are still kind of abstract right now. Uh, it really depends on what kind of momentum we start seeing uh, coming in the market. Now, you already know that I have some long positions. I've, I've told you guys about some that are my plays for this coming year and there are also some as well that i'm watching uh, these are plays like Chainlink. these are ones like basic attention token both of these we will talk about and also ravencoin which will be another one we talk about today but there'll be a fourth one as well and it's one that i know is very controversial but again it's just simply a trade position and that's going to be xrp okay so i, I want to let you guys know it right away i'm not going to you know make a title like i have in the video and stuff and then you know not give you guys the coins right away so if you want to stick around for it uh, you know feel free to. And again, it's not financial advice. It's just me trying to analyze charts to some degree. Now, I'm not going to do too much crazy analysis on basic attention token because quite frankly, my analysis is quite simple. I think we've entered into the next cycle for BAT. And the thing to factor in here is that it's going to be a longer cycle than some of these kind of periodic rallies uh, compared to Bitcoin. We're first taking a look at BAT BTC on Bitrix. Uh, I would think that the major thing we want to see here in the sense of price is for us to hold at this general support range that we've seen in the past year, uh, which was, again, previous resistance back here. So this is a very important range here. And once we break past the previous highs, the weekly indicators will follow here. We will see an increase here on the squeeze momentum indicator. And then also here uh, on the uh, MACD, we'll see divergence increasing and hopefully the stochastic RSI popping up. Uh, my only concern here is that both of the lines on the stochastic RSI are downward. However, we've seen in the past that many times it dips below and it continues higher, right? So again, we want to see here that this holds at this range and continues higher. Uh, in the sense of a USDT, let's go ahead and take a look on Bitrix here. Again, what I like to see here with these altcoins is that during all the silence, we've been seeing higher lows here, right? You start to see this rising up here. And along with that as well, you could add a line of resistance, right? We go down here. So the major goal here would to see a breakthrough and a continuation higher. Not only a, a breakthrough this, but also a higher close than the previous highs here, right? So that's what we're looking for. The chart looks great here, uh, except for the MACD and the stochastic RSI. I would say that the squeeze momentum is still showcasing that there's momentum on the trend. I like the wedge building up here, the higher lows, lower highs. This is setting up for a potential good breakout here. Now, the other one I want to take a look at here is obviously Chainlink. All right, so we'll take a look here at Chainlink on Binance. Again, another similar formulation on the wedge here. Higher lows here uh, during this kind of bloody period of time for cryptocurrencies. Uh, since back when Bitcoin peaked in June, we've been setting higher lows here as much as there have been pullbacks and lower highs. So again, very similar formulation on the weekly. It's looking good. We don't have a crazy amount of price action to work with. But again, I, the indicators here uh, are definitely giving, uh, would give, there's more, to, hopefully more to give in this case for the indicators. But so long as price holds in this range, I'm not too concerned because if it starts to take up here, squeeze momentum will hold. We'll also see the MACD probably cross back up and we'll see the stochastic R. So I actually like it when it's down here because it's cheap in this case and I look for a cross, right? 
So again, indicators uh, across some of these plays are kind of iffy, to be completely honest with you guys. We're waiting to get more of a solidification here. We don't have much price action to work with. But the major thing here is that price is really what is standing out here. I want to see higher lows across the market. The third one I want to talk about, we'll talk about Ravencoin, but I want to actually dive in to XRP here because this is a really interesting scenario here. We've got a lot of price action to work with. And in fact, it's been around for so long, I'm actually going to use the monthly for this. I think it's just much more... Uh, efficient to use, and we'll use it on the logarithmic chart to see it much more clearly. Now, interestingly enough, uh, some of the oldest price data we have to use for XRP is on Poloniex, and I always like to use the oldest data set. It may not give us the most accurate volume, that's fine. Uh, that's really not what I'm looking for here. I'm looking for price action and how something has performed in the past, and what kind of data do we have to work with here? Well, the thing I want to really emphasize here is that ever since the opening here in February 2015 for XRP on USDT, we can see here that it was about a 24-week period before we actually started to leap up higher. And we're just about to hit about 24 weeks as well, or excuse me, 24 months, my apologies, I forget we switched the time frame, 24 months here since we had the most recent peak here. And very similar kind of correction levels, something beyond 80% here. And of course, it's a little bit stronger in this case because we had such a stark rally. This was just the open here. So of course, it's gonna probably be a little bit more of a severe correction than back here beforehand, right? Now, what I like to see is the declining divergence on the MACD, the growth in the squeeze momentum indicator. And the stochastic R side looking like any second, if we get a good weekly green candle, this is gonna pop up. Now, the thing about XRP you have to understand is that it's very fast moving. Uh, it was really just a matter of really four key weeks here, right? This week here and these past three weeks where va the vast majority of price action uh, came in for XRP. It's very important to understand that. So this is uh, important to note for two reasons. One, I'm not just going to buy and hold XRP. The big issue that I see with a lot of people in the crypto space is that they're eager to average in, and that's fine. Uh, but I would say if, if you really want to not be stressing about XRP 24/7, and you don't want to have to worry uh, about like you know whether or not it's going to drop 30 or 40 percent. Wait till on one of these weekly candles we get a significant amount of volume. You can see the difference here when the cycles start, uh, even when they continue here, right? You can start to see that volume starting to register in, and you can see it on much shorter time frames like the weekly, right? So within uh, these, these, I, I'm sorry, I, I know earlier I probably just said weekly again, on these monthly uh, candles and stuff where the volume really starts to showcase. And those three to four months are really where the vast majority of price action comes in. But you can start to see it here on the weekly. The indicators uh, here on the weekly are flashing signals very quickly, right? Here on the third week of green price action, before any significant gains came in, stochastic RSI popped up into the purple channel. We got a cross on the MACD along with that as well. The squeeze momentum indicator starting to leap up as well setting higher levels. So that's what we want to look for here, guys. Again, that's the kind of stuff we look for in price, okay? So we're simplifying it here on the monthly. And another thing as well is the rising lows here. You can see here that we had rising lows throughout uh, before the previous cycle. And along with that as well, if we actually have a line that's pretty much, I tried to get it as close to the angle as possible on the logarithmic chart. You can see here that we're resting right along this line. So it's gonna be a matter if we can hold this level. I'm gonna be very worried if we break below 20 cents and go towards like 19 or 18 cents. But if it holds here, if volume starts to kick in, I'm gonna be very excited on possibly placing a trade on this. But I'll let you guys know if I do make that trade. So that's XRP. Uh, we can take a look at the Bitcoin chart as well, real quick. Uh, I think we're going to want to look here on Poloniex. Yes. So this is just kind of a form of naked trading here. I really don't want to focus so much on the indicators. The indicators are actually looking good. Squeeze momentum indicators rising. We've got the divergence declining, looking for a potential MACD cross later down the line. And the stochastic color size lifting up. But along with that, major thing that I, I want to focus on is really three key things, right? higher lows back here between uh, 2014 and 2017 before the rally left, and then also building support on a general resistance range here at the same consistent line here, right? We can see we built support here and built support over here. Now, the major thing I'm looking for compared to Bitcoin is that this holds above 2,700 Satoshis. If this continues to hold here, it starts to get volume, it starts to go higher, maybe even retesting up here to 3,700, possibly go long on a trade. And the general gist is that XRP is a momentum play. So after about a month or two, if not maybe three or four months now that we're in a larger market, uh, I would like to see uh, it test towards this range here between these highs and the highs up here. Now, generally speaking, right, 
the the general philosophy of these kind of lines here is to keep in mind uh, levels where we're going to start at least for me personally i would start to average out of my position now, the first thing to consider is that this line here is factoring in all of the highs so this is the base range here from previous history where we start to hit, hit resistance and we should start again considering probably take profits right at least uh you know in this case really starting to take good chunks you could have them a little bit earlier you could have them a little bit later we've always learned that it's good to be a little less greedy and probably take some profits around this range but again you guys are gonna have to determine that for yourselves if you wanted to make a trade it's not financial advice another thing as well is to consider that sometimes we go way above and beyond so we might want to take you know for myself personally i might want to take a partial share up around this range and continue to let some of it ride up here so i can get some of those absorbing gains continuing higher through the more exponential ranges okay so that's generally what this chart is very simple analysis nothing too complex so let's go ahead and take a look here on ravencoin on the weekly time frame for bitrix one thing that i want to note right away here is that the indicators look probably the best out of any of the cryptocurrencies we took a look at We've got the MACD cross all the way back here in October. We can see the divergence is growing to a slight degree. We can see the stochastic RSI popping back up on an upward trend, and we can see the squeeze momentum indicator coming up. Very nice to see this. Now, another thing to take into mind is that we have rising lows here, right? So as we go across the border, we can see, generally speaking, that the lows are rising, holding a general uptrend line here. And the major thing that I want to see here is that we get above this range here at around 450 Satoshis, okay? So I want to see us get above this previous high. We can see that it's been acting as resistance. It almost seems like we're kind of coiling at that range. So I'll go ahead and I'll draw a trend line here. The major thesis would be for us to break above here so we can start to really enter into those parabolic trends we've seen in the past. Okay, so that's it in the sense of like altcoins. Uh, the the last thing I take a look at is the USDT chart, which also looks good. Uh, the major thing here is that we're making support at a higher low, and then also on a range that acted as some resistance. If you take a look more at the daily chart, okay, so that's good to see. Uh, the thing is, these altcoins again. The major theme that we're seeing is that there's higher lows, and that's what matters because if altcoins are setting higher lows in USDT, not to mention Bitcoin as well. Uh, during these periods of time where Bitcoin has been declining, you can usually be quite confident that you've got an interesting play at hand. All right, so that's the key thing to keep in mind here. All right, so we've done enough uh, chart analysis. I wanna go ahead and talk about a really interesting post that came out today, and it's not the independent here. Uh, this is what actually just kind of opened my eyes to something that can, uh, happened as a recent, and it has to do with Ross Ulbrich. Uh, Ross has actually been doing a lot of interesting Bitcoin analysis pieces that he's gotten uh, other individuals to upload to Medium. And I've, I just gotta start by saying, you gotta love the independent here using like a photo of a guy who's wearing like, a mask here it's like it, it just seems like it's i guess it's kind of maybe they're trying to play to the anonymous role and stuff but i just feel like this is such a, a bad image to use here for ross reason why is because this is ross here this is like he's an average everyday guy you know uh, there's so many misconceptions so many false allegations against ross i was actually fortunate enough i got to meet ross's mother in las vegas uh when i was at the uh the litecoin summit sweetest lady sweetest lady i've ever met and the thing about it here is that they they kind of discuss and kind of precurse to uh, ross's prediction of a hundred thousand dollar bitcoin and he mainly focuses on using elliott wave theory and i will say that as much as i actually really like parts of his analysis and i want to ask you guys if you'd like me to take a deeper dive here and maybe even generate some questions for ross in this case to pass on love to do something like that i think it'd be really cool to you know with ross being in prison and stuff I, I think it's it's important for us to keep in communication with him he's done so much in pioneering for the cryptocurrency space so i definitely would like to know if you guys would like something like that i could do a deeper dive analysis on his piece provide some positive feedback negative feedback but the major thing here is that ross put out a letter talking about his previous predictions on bitcoin uh, how he utilized at elliott wave theory to get these price predictions and get quite an accurate measure on them and also a few other factors as well but between these different articles, uh, you've, this is kind of the primer article. He notifies to read this first. You can go through and read some of his other ones. A primer on Elliott Wave Theory, which I know many of you out there are big fans of. I don't use it too extensively, but I think it's rooted in the kind of uh, the stepping stones of market cycles. I completely agree with that. Uh, you can see Bitcoin kind of on the charts here, the big picture, uh, the end of the cycle, room to run. This is where he talks a little bit about his 100K prediction and also talking a little bit about where we are in the cycle right now. So I recommend you guys take a dive through this. If you just look up Bitcoin by Ross, uh, Medium article, you'll be able to find it. 
and you'll be able to look through all these different article pieces. But uh, w we can definitely do a deeper dive on this. On the sense of his uh, general prediction, I'll give a surface level comment. Um, I think that his prediction of 100K is spot on. I think between the stock to flow model, between things like Elliott Wave Theory, all these different points of analysis point to a big even like 100,000, right? And a 5X from the previous highs at this kind of market to scale is much more reasonable than some of the, t the, the 20 to 50 to 100, 100Xs that we've seen in the past for Bitcoin, and sometimes 1,000Xs in this case. <laughs> so I think Ross's price target's great. Uh, the only thing that I, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, is that on his uh, price target, I think he has a time frame of about you know, sometime in near 2020. And I do disagree with this. I think it's a little too early. Uh, but again, I, I'm not 100% certain on it, not to mention as well. I want to spend a little bit more time analysis, uh, spending some time to analyze Ross's positions. And again, if you guys would like a video on that, feel free to leave a comment. And uh, if you got something to say for Ross as well, feel free to leave a comment as well. Um, but again, Last thing in the sense of crypto is the crypto franc. So this is a topic that has been <clears throat> not only brewing in Switzerland, which is this, which is what the crypto franc is referring to, but in central banks across the world. And then it's central bank digital currencies or just stable coins in general that are backed by fiat currencies. Now, again, we are seeing these same kind of comments here from central banks across the world in the sense of stable coins and a continued concern of run to the banks on stable coins. So basically, there being an issue that stable coins have some form of fractional reserves. And when people go to actually claim their stable coin, that say Coinbase uh, or, you know, countless others like True USD, all these different companies, or Trust Token, I guess the actual parent company, and Paxos not having all of the actual dollars to back the one-to-one -one ratio, right? Now, outside of Tether, outside of Tether, I would not be concerned about any of the stable coins. And even for Tether, if they had a 70% re reserve ratio in this case, it's much less of a threat than traditional banks, which is why this is so hypocritical. Again, they, they talk in the article about some of the benefits. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to highlight at the bottom here, they talked about, um, they, 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 well, basically, let's kind of get to the, the sauce here, really. Uh, this is basically where they talked about how it's overall going to be negative in this case uh, due to bank runs, even though it could have a discipline, um, dis, disciplinary effect on the banking sector as an alternative investment. All right, so let me make it very clear here, guys. Like These companies are audited. 24 seven to make sure that they have a one-to-one -one reserve ratio. Commercial banks every year are fighting to have lower and lower reserve requirements, even though they are audited at around 3%, 5%, 10%, who knows? It really depends on the country, the jurisdiction, and the laws in relation to those reserve ratios. But to keep it simple, to say that there is a risk on bank runs, an increased risk on bank runs with something like this. It's an in and out system. You put dollars in, and if you want to withdraw it to a bank account, you can do it. It's been working ever since. And that's why the uh, the volume of dollars that have been inputted into USDC, Paxos, all these different systems, TUSD, whatever it is, it has worked consistently well. It's completely regulated. It's under the same scrutiny as traditional financial applications. I don't see why there's any risk to this. What I do see as a risk is that central banks are concerned that this is going to get out of their realm of control. But if everything is KYC'd, you know where the flow of money is. You know where it's going, right? So I, I just don't see the concerns here. I don't think it's justified. But I'd like to know what you guys think down below in the comments. All right. So the last thing that I want to take a look at here is some data points here, uh, three key charts here, and then we'll take a look a little bit at Forex. First one here is a good visualization of the original decline in central bank assets. And now the United States stepping in here just as we started to see Japan and the ECB cutting their stimulus. We have now seen a re-spark in stimulus, both in the ECB, as they were um, pretty much silent throughout 2019, canceling their QE program, now reinstating it and also with the United States. Now it makes Japan look like it's doing nothing. <laughs> but we can see here that about a, on a monthly basis, we're getting about $50 billion of stimulus. And this is coming through tre uh, treasury purchases, uh, other government bond purchases and other central banks, and then also uh, pickups on assets like mortgage-backed securities, in the case of Japan, purchases of equities, you name it. $50 billion jam-packed in the economy every single month. 
Seems a little artificial to me. But along with this as well, this is why I don't bet against equities. Uh, you can see here on the implied Fed funds, Fed funds rate, uh, this chart is maybe a little bit confusing for some people. So let me make it very, um, it, it's not, not not trying to be rude to you guys. It just, it literally took me a while to get this when I was first studying central bank policy. So this chart here demonstrates the prediction, the implied federal funds rate for the general year of 2020 and also 2021 back here during turn, during uh, turn, uh, different time frames. So you can see here, this is September 20th of 2017. These were the different kind of estimates of where rates could be. So you saw they could be anywhere from near 1% up to 4%. And as we move over time, we get towards, let's say for example, 12, 11, so December 11th, just the other day, we can see that we have a much better understanding of where this target range might be. Now it's not finite, but this is an estimation from central banks. Now we know central banks can be wrong in many occurrences, but we can see here between 2020 and 2021 that we're not looking to get anywhere near the previous rate levels. The highest estimate here is below 2.5, and it looks like we have some room as well to continue declining, right? So that's the thing that I would notify here, guys. It's very important to understand uh, that over time, rates are going to be holding at this range, right? The central bank is going to continue. Both of these occurrences show a decline and a predicted decline in this case to continue as time progresses that we are going to have lower rates. Now, central banks are going to utilize every tool they can to keep this expansion going. They've made that very clear. So we need to factor that in here. That's why I'm not bearish on equities yet. Until central banks use everything they can and they still can't supply upside movement, that's when I'm going to be bearish. That's when I'm going to start making some trades to the downside. But for now, I'm just building hedging positions. All right. All right, last thing I want to talk about here, I really don't want to talk so much about politics, especially UK politics, because as much as I've been passionate with politics, economics, finance, whatever it may be over the last decade, or almost near decade, it's pretty crazy to think about. Um, major thing I want to emphasize here is just the election results that came out last night. So the conservatives won over the Labour Party. Uh, long story short, I don't have much of an opinion on this. Uh, it was a pretty good sizable victory here from my understanding in UK uh, in UK politics. However, the reason I don't want to speak uh, towards one side or the others, I'm just not informative on it, to be fair with you guys. I'd like to study more into it. I want to understand more about other world governments and kind of keep up to date, but I haven't even been keeping up much with US politics. It's just been so much noise over the last two or three years. So that being realized, uh, again, the major thing, actually, it's been noise for the last decade or so. Yeah. But anyways, but the major thing I want to emphasize here is what this has done to markets. Well, it seems like markets are much more confident for a Brexit resolution. And we've been seeing that reflected, I think, for the last few months in the Great British Pound. You can see here going from $1.20 uh, per British Pound all the way up here to $1.33 per British Pound. So really interesting stuff here. It looks like Brexit, which is one of the many fear cases for the global economy, might actually be coming to some form of resolution. And we can see it as well being reflected in the euro. Take a look at the euro here. We're coming up here on this general channel range here. Uh, now, again, we've actually been calling for the newsletter for a short around this range, or at least that's what I'm watching for. But you can see here over the last few months since October, there's been a growth of confidence here. Euro has been gaining against the dollar. The Dixie, dollar index, really starting to break off the trend here. I basically talked in the newsletter, if we close below this range, I'm bearish now on the dollar, uh, which is pretty hard for me to say, because I had a very vehement position that the dollar in this case was going to continue rising with the kind of pressure that we've had on the dollar uh, across the global economy due to the tax bill um, and the repatriation of funds to the tax bill and also the Fed. Well, it actually makes sense because originally the Fed was increasing interest rates, making dollar capital more expensive. There was the repatriation through the tax bill, which put a more for those two things were putting a dollar squeeze on the global economy. But now we've started to cut interest rates. We've started to buy more mortgage-backed securities and more treasuries. We've started to stimulate the economy again. And I would say that the effectiveness of that repatriation is probably wearing off a little bit. And now you've got all these other positive things that are boosting up the euro, boosting up the great British pound, and that's what's leading to the decline here. So changing macro factors. You've got to keep on top of these things in order to make really sound trades and investments.
Anyways, that's going to be it for today's video, guys. I've rambled on enough for today. If you liked the rambling, you can drop a like. I always appreciate it. It means a lot to me. So if you guys like the content or if you don't, um, and along with that as well, leave a comment down below if you got some feedback or something to say on any of these issues, guys. That being said, I hope you all are having a fantastic Friday wherever you are, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.